I am Dr. Leonard Freeman, uh, and uh, I am from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center in New York. And uh, what I was asked to talk to you about was to give you a little background history on nuclear medicine. I noticed you did have a talk this morning uh, a little bit explaining what nuclear medicine was. I'll do a little bit of the same, and I'll tell you some things that allowed nuclear medicine to develop, you know, historically, which uh, I think will be a little entertaining and of interest to you. So in any event, um, I think you've learned pretty much from what you've heard thus far today, you know, what nuclear medicine is. And, uh, you know, we deal with both diagnosis and treatment, and I understand many of you, if not all of you, really have had some exposure to uh, nuclear medicine, I guess principally on a diagnostic standpoint, although some of you therapeutically as well. And uh, you see it says, as a discipline of medicine, it's restricted to unsealed sources. What does that mean? Well, you're all familiar with radiation therapy and cobalt machines and things like that and high-energy X-ray. Those are called sealed sources. In other words, when you use radiation actually itself to treat. Unsealed sources means that's what we give the patient either orally or intravenously, whatever. That's called unsealed sources, and that's what we deal with in nuclear medicine. And as you see, it, uh, it conceptually relates to what we call the tracer principle, and that I'm going to explain to you. But basically, furthermore, you know, What's the difference between x-ray and, and nuclear medicine? And again, you may have heard some of this earlier as well. But you know, with all x-ray procedures, you're dealing with structure, uh, anatomy, things like that, you know, pl using a plain chest x-ray like on the lower left or a CAT scan. This deals all with uh, the way an x-ray beam passes through a patient and the differences between, let's say, soft tissue in the lung and the ribs, you know, bony structures and things like that. That's what really makes the picture. Uh, by us giving what we call radiopharmaceuticals, and I'll get to that in just a moment, to you, uh, we basically are looking at uh, various things. In this case, this is a lung scan. Uh, this is looking at blood flow to the lungs. And uh, uh, it deals with looking at things like, say, you're probably familiar with the d disease called pulmonary embolism, where clots uh, go to the lungs. I mean, most recently, I can think in terms of celebrities, and many celebrities have gotten pulmonary embolism. Serena Williams, the tennis player, uh, last year had quite a bout with pulmonary embolism, and uh, that's how the diagnosis is made uh, it, very often. Uh, here's another example. Here's, here's gallbladder disease. Well, that's a very common disease. Now, the supposedly 20, 25 million Americans walking around with gallstones, which is, uh, I don't even know it, uh, and that's called chronic gallbladder disease, or the term is called cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis. Okay? And what you're seeing on the left is an ultrasound exam. And the ultrasound exam, uh, if I, there it is right here. Whoops. My red arrow is coming and going. <laughs> the ultrasound exam shows you these, these white things all over here. That, those are gallstones. Okay? Now, that's how one diagnoses chronic cholecystitis. These are patients who, you know, may have fatty food intolerance or you get discomfort when you have fatty food, that type of thing. <clears throat> now, uh, that is how you make a diagnosis of chronic cholecystitis. But as you know, unfortunately, uh, people sometimes develop an acute attack of cholecystitis from an acute gallbladder problem. What causes that? Well, the little schematic diagram on the top shows you is that when, when one of those stones gets out of the gallbladder and blocks the duct that leads to the gallbladder, okay, then the gallbladder starts expanding, it gets infected, and that's what causes an acute attack. So how do we diagnose acute gallbladder disease or acute cholecystitis, we do that with a scan that we call the HIDA scan. We give the patient a material intravenously that gets picked up by the liver and gets transported out into the bile and out into the uh, intestine. And for instance, you can see in the middle here, uh, here's the liver, uh, here's the bile ducts, and here's the gallbladder. Okay, so if this patient were having acute pain now, we can do this kind of scan, which we call a HIDA scan, and we can say the patient is not having an acute attack of cholecystitis right now. But if you look at the picture on the right, notice here's the liver, here's the intestine, and there's no gallbladder. So this means that that duct going to the gallbladder is blocked, and the patient does have an acute attack. This is information you can't get from an x-ray, but you can get from a nuclear medicine scan because we are studying function, the way the organ works, okay, and the way the organ handles the material, and we basically fool the organ. 
in many respects because uh, we may give the organ, uh, we may give the patient something that uh, a particular organ cannot distinguish between what it might normally use metabolically in terms of its own function and what we're giving it radioactively. But now because it's radioactive, we can now actually take a picture and see what's going on. <clears throat> so in nuclear medicine, we have two tools to our trade. We have our radioactive drugs, which is what I've just been talking about. We call those radiopharmaceuticals. And on the bottom, you see, we have instruments in order to image them. Now, radiopharmaceuticals, radioisotopes, have different types of properties. You've probably heard, uh, and you know, someplace back in high school or, or college physics, you've learned about the fact that isotopes have uh, alpha rays, beta rays, gamma rays, different things like that, okay? Well, in order to study a patient, alpha and beta, isotopes that have alpha and beta radiation, that doesn't leave the body. That stays within the body. It's great if we want to treat the patient or treat a disease, but if we want to take pictures and see what's going on, we can't do that. We need an isotope that's a gamma ray emitter, and that leaves the body, and we have instruments which we call gamma cameras. And we take pictures and can see exactly how that thing, like I just showed you with the liver, how that thing is moving to that, through that particular organ. Okay. Now, um, just, just, let's go ahead. Okay. So a good example of, of two different radiopharmaceuticals used for, used, used for different purposes is radioiodine. Now, iodine is very important in our diet. And the gland that's most involved with iodine is the thyroid gland, okay? Because we have salt. You have salt in your diet, whatever. The thyroid picks it up. It makes thyroid hormone out of the iodine, okay? So if we want to study problems of the thyroid gland, we can use a radioactive iodine. And the thyroid gland cannot distinguish that radioactive iodine that we give it from the normal iodine that it picks up in salt, okay? So it goes to the thyroid gland, but now, because it's got the one particular isotope, iodine-123, has gamma radiation, then we can take pictures and take a picture of the thyroid. But we also have another material, iodine-131. You know why? Because we treat thyroid disease. We treat hyperthyroidism. We treat thyroid cancer, okay? So when we treat hyperthyroidism with thyroid cancer, we use iodine-131 rather than iodine-123. But if we're doing a diagnostic study, we don't want that beta radiation. We just want the gamma radiation to get our pictures because the patient's going to get a bigger radiation dose under those circumstances. Okay. So I'm supposed to talk about history. Uh, and this is just a little cartoon. Of course, you always like to know where you came from. And um, in any event, let's talk a little bit about history. Okay. So the tracer principle, that's essentially what I just described to you. That's the whole concept of being able to image an organ with a radioisotope, okay? And the important thing is, is that we can give tiny, tiny amounts of this, these agents for diagnostic purposes, and it doesn't change the body at all. It doesn't change the way that organ functions, but it gets into the normal pathway of metabolism for that organ, and we can take pictures and follow it along. So we're able to get what we call physiologic localization without any pharmacological effect. Okay. This is one of the fathers of our specialty, Dr. George de Hevesy, who's a Hungarian man. And we go all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s, okay? And he started off, he did something really, really interesting <clears throat> long before the stuff was being used in humans. He took an isotope of lead, okay? And he put it in the soil. And plants, right where a bunch of plants were and whatever, and then he actually waited a couple of days and he took samples of the leaves and samples of the stem and samples of different parts of that plant. And he showed, and this is the instrument that he used actually to do it. This was called the gold leaf electroscope. So he took the stem and he took the leaves and he put it next to this electroscope. And this is a little gold leaf here and this is a lead bar. And if it was radioactive and it was picking the stuff up, that gold leaf would flick away from the lead bar, okay? Now, you, of course, know the term Geiger counter, okay? This is an updated version of this old gold leaf electroscope that allows you to detect radiation. So he was able to show that this lead was picked up at different rates by the, by the stem of the plant, by the leaves of the plant. It didn't handle it the same way. Now, there's a very interesting aside about Dr. De Hevesy, which I'm going to tell you. 
He won the Nobel Prize for this, by the way. Uh, Dr. De Hevesy was a bachelor. He was an anorectic, okay? And he lived in a boarding house in Budapest. And um, the boarding lady, the lady who owned the boarding house, would feed the tenants food every night, and he fed them corned beef hash. And each night, you know, he wouldn't even hardly eat the stuff, and he left some over. And she would serve the same thing every night. So he had a sneaking suspicion that she was you reusing the same stuff and serving it night after night. So he figured he would do something clever. He took some of his radioactive lead, okay, and he put it in the food after he shoveled it to the side of his plate the first night. The next night when she served the corned beef hash, he took a napkin, put some of the stuff in a napkin, brought it back to his lab, and counted it, and sure enough, the lead was in it. So he went ahead and he confronted the landlady and told her what she'd been doing. She didn't have too much of a sense of humor, so she kicked him out. <laughs> but that was one of the first examples of using the tracer principle, okay? Okay. Now, uh, here's the next thing that was done. Now, this says 58 because it was still being done as you know, recently as 58, which historically is not that long ago. You see what happens? Here's a little helmet that was put over the patient's head, and they put a small amount of this human serum albumin isotope labeled with iodine-131, and you can see there were little pockets on that helmet, and they took a little counter, like a little Geiger counter, and they counted over those. This patient had a you know, brain tumor, and they were counting over those little areas to see exactly where it was, okay? Obviously, long before CAT scanning, long before a lot of things, okay? So this is what they were doing. Okay, now... In 1931, a very famous chemist named Dr. Ernest Lawrence invented a machine that you've probably all heard of. It's called the cyclotron, okay? The cyclotron produces isotopes. And basically, he produced iodine compounds very, very early. He produced phosphorus. Ernest Lawrence was a chemist, and you see the picture next to him is his brother, John Lawrence. John Lawrence was a physician. So John Lawrence used some of his brother's P32, which is a pure beta remitter, okay, no gammas, a pure beta remitter, and he treated patients who had blood dyscrasias, leukemias, and things of that sort. Now, um, the name Enrico Fermi on the left there is a name some of you might recognize. Why? He was one of the fathers of the atomic bomb. He worked under the stands at the University of Chicago when the A-bomb was being uh, developed, okay? He came over from Italy, and he was, of course, very, very important to American defense, okay? And uh, he dealt with some of these cyclone products. And you see a Dr. Joseph Hamilton, who also worked with Dr. Lawrence at uh, Berkeley, California, where he developed a cyclotron. And he was using some of this radioiodine. He was learning how to do uptake studies, you know, using it and understanding how the thyroid gland would actually pick it up. Okay. I'm now going to skip to somebody called Dr. Sam Seidlin. Who's Dr. Seidlin? Dr. Seidlin is actually from my hospital, from Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. Dr. Seidlin was an endocrinologist who worked at Montefiore Hospital from the 1930s through the 1950s, okay? And he had a patient with a very advanced thyroid cancer, okay? And what did he do? Well, what could he do? Well, you know, there wasn't a lot he can do for the patient. You know, chemo wasn't really very developed. There's not a lot of chemo you can use for thyroid cancer anyway. But he was aware of the fact that in Berkeley, California, Dr. Ernest Lawrence was, had a cyclotron and was producing radioiodine. And also, there was another one up in Boston at MIT. So, of course, this was 1943, I think it was. The war was on. And basically, uh, you know, it was much easier to speak to somebody in Boston than to speak to somebody in California. And he f treated his patient, which I'll get to in a moment, very successfully. And he wrote a paper, uh, which was published on December 7th, 1946, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Very prophetic date, right? December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, five years earlier. And that's about 14, 15 months before the A-bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end the war. So everybody was frightened. You know the feeling everybody had in 9-11? Same feeling. Everybody was very, very frightened about this nuclear energy, and the U.S. Congress was wrestling with the whole thought of what could they possibly do with this horrible, horrible stuff. And then all of a sudden, Dr. Sam Seidlin writes this paper and says, hey, you can do good things also. You can treat cancer with it. 
And uh, that's why it's been called the most important paper ever written in uh, nuclear medicine. Well, this is just a little anecdote. Uh, Dr. Sam Seidel was a physiology. He was a Canadian, okay? He was from McGill. Uh, during the 1930s, he came to New York. He worked at Montefiore Medical Center. And uh, he had this patient with um, thyroid cancer. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. He called up Dr. Uh, Evans in Boston, uh, who ran the cyclotron at MIT to get the radioiodine. Said cost $1,800 an hour. He didn't know what that meant. He says, how many millicuries do you want? He didn't know what that meant. So he says, give me an hour's worth, you know, anyway. But uh, he went through this whole thing. I'm not going to uh, go through the whole thing now. But what I want to show you here is this is typical of, of what was achieved. This is a, the bone here. You can see the hip. And this is a bone that's uh, it's called the ischium. It's the bone that comes down in the lower part of the pelvis. It's totally destroyed by the cancer. And here's what the radioiodine did. It filled it all in completely. Very, very dramatically, okay? Well, that was 1943. The patient, BB, okay, he went public. He went to Life magazine in 1949, six years later. The name was Mr. Brunstein. And um, here's a story of what he was. He was a Brooklyn shoe salesman destined to become one of the most famous patients in medical history. The first person known to be cured of metastatic cancer. Metastatic cancer has always been 100% fatal, but tumors were destroyed in a simple, almost miraculous way by the drinking of four doses of radioactive iodine. He appeared to be suffering from an overactive thyroid gland. He was too weak and emaciated. His thyroid gland had been removed surgically. Radioiodine was given on the theory that his thyroid tumor would absorb the drug. If they did, they would be destroyed. Three months after he drank the first glass of tasteless, colorless liquid, he started to put on weight. After three additional dates, the tumors eventually disappeared completely. Okay? So this is one of the seminal events uh, in terms of thyroid therapy, okay? And this is a very routine we thing we do. Uh, I treat at least a couple of cases a week of thyroid cancer with radioiodine, okay? So it's a very, very specific treatment that you have because here you are, radioactive iodine's picked up by the thyroid gland. Well, how could you be more specific than that? As you well know, when you get chemotherapy and things like that, there are effects on other organs and things like that. This is something very specific for the thyroid gland. And, it was done, I can say proud, proudly, at my hospital. I wasn't there, but it was done there. All right. <clears throat> the most common isotope, you've probably heard the name today, technetium 99M. Technetium is the most common isotope we use. It's a gamma emitter, and we use this for diagnostic purposes. Dr. Glenn Seaborg also worked in Berkeley, California, and he was the first commissioner of the Atomic Energy Commission when it was formed after World War II. Dr. Segre from Italy came and joined him and was involved in all of this. So, Technetium 99M, literally 90% of the diagnostic studies we do in any given day is done with that isotope. It's incredibly versatile, and uh, it can, we can attach it to a lot of different tracers that can image various organs throughout the entire body. And you see it's got a half, that's another property of an isotope is a half-life, six hours. So basically, uh, you know, things like uranium and radium, they have enormously long half-life, hundreds and hundreds of years. Here's something that's got a six-hour half-life, so it works very well for diagnostic purposes. It's a pure gamma. It doesn't give a lot of radiation to the patient, and, you know, it's the most common thing that we use. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the instruments. Well, here are our two instrument pioneers, Dr. Benjamin Kasson and Dr. Hal Anger, okay? Uh, Dr. Kasson first developed an instrument called a rectilinear scanner. Because I showed you the way we just used to count things and I showed you the helmet over the head, but now we had these instruments that actually were able to move along and actually plot out and make a picture of an entire organ. And uh, here you see a very early rectilinear scan. The patient laid under this detector on the right and uh, this detector moved back and forth across them, and you got this thing that would tap holes on a paper, would tap little, little holes, and you get a picture of an organ. Well, it got more sophisticated. Then the next development was actually developing the use of x-ray film for taking images and exposing x-ray film. So now if you look at all these different examples uh, around there, here's, here's a lung scan, I showed you that before. Here's a thyroid scan, okay? Here's a bone scan. Okay, I'll show you more examples of that as we go along. We were able, and these were almost all technetium compounds, so we were able to image all these different types of organs. 
anger developed a camera, where instead of moving back and forth across the patient, this was a bigger detector head, and this was able to, in fact, pick up uh, how the radiation was. I know you had a talk this morning on how nuclear medicine works, so hopefully this will be a little bit familiar to you. Okay, now look at this. Look at the dates here. Here's how a bone scan developed from the old rectilinear scanner through uh, uh, an uh, uh, early camera picture, and uh, now, most recently, through a much fancier thing, used something we call PET scanning. And uh, how fancy can we get? Okay, this is what's happened with technology. Uh, this unfortunate particular patient, you know, has, uh, obviously those are all, all, all bone lesions. The patient had prostate cancer. He actually got better, though. Nowadays, you know, it's amazing. I, I see scans that look like this, and then, uh, with the new medications for prostate cancer, boy, I mean, I've seen them disappear completely. It's absolutely incredible. Before we had CAT scans, you know, the pancreas was always considered a very hidden organ. Of course, now you look at it with CT, you look at it with MRI, but before we had that, we did have materials that actually allowed us to see the pancreas as well. This is the liver, and this is the pancreas here. We don't do this anymore. Here's a kidney scan. <clears throat> so here's a patient that was in an accident, and you can see, this is, this is looking from behind. This is the right kidney, this is the left kidney, and this patient's injured their left kidney. You can see the difference, the diminished uptake that you have throughout that left kidney. And here's a CAT scan that shows you there's a big blood clot around the kidney. This is a lung scan. Now, lung scans, uh, this is looking at blood flow to the lungs, something we inject intravenously. And this is uh, some particles we have the patient breathe in. And basically, if you have a clot in the lung, usually, the airways remain open. They don't change. So if you have, let's say, a patient who's got uh, emphysema <clears throat> or some chronic lung disease, the perfusion scan, which is the blood flow scan, and the ventilation scan will look identical. The fact that we have that big defect on the perfusion scan and we have a normal ventilation scan, that's what makes the diagnosis of a clot in the lung of pulmonary embolism. Look at these pictures now, okay? We can do cities, we can make movies, okay? This is an isotope that stays in the blood. What is it? Well, it's the patient's own blood cells. We draw some blood out from the patients, and outside the body, we label it with some technetium, and then we re-inject it back into the patient. So where does it stay? It stays in the bloodstream. So you're seeing the heart, uh, you're seeing the liver, you're seeing the spleen, and unfortunately there's a little too much light in the room, but you're seeing these are the blood vessels coming down. Why do we do this? This is a study we do for GI bleeding. If a patient comes in and he's got some blood in his stool, uh, whatever, and the first question is where is it coming from, okay? I mean, the GI tract's a pretty big thing going from the esophagus all the way down to the lower colon, okay? So basically, where is it bleeding from? So if we put this material, the patient's own red cells, back into them and take images, in this case movies, which I'll show you, what happens is uh, it will, where will it leak? It, it will leak out of the bloodstream into the intestine where the bleeding is occurring. Okay, watch. See that? So basically, the bleed is here. Watch, watch what happens here. It's going to start here, and it's going to go upwards and downwards. This is the descending colon. So if this patient needs something done therapeutically, and this can be done in angiography, uh, the angiographers can actually put some gel foam. They can stop the bleeding by uh, putting some uh, directly you know, into, through a catheter. <clears throat> but this tells the angiographer which blood vessel to get. There's a bunch of blood vessels supplying different parts of the bowel. So by him knowing that this is coming from the area of the descending colon, they can specifically go after that particular blood vessel that supplies that part of the colon, okay? Here's another one. Now look at this one. Now notice it's coming from the upper abdomen, and it's forming, this is coming, the stomach is coming down like this. This is coming from the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. That's an entirely different situation than the first case I showed you. Okay? So here, 
uh, again, it would be a different vessel they would go after. If, I mean, the bleeding was really bad and the patient were not stable and the surgeon had to operate, it also tells the surgeon where to go. If they have to operate without a study like this, they're going in blindly. They, they, they have to open up the belly and first figure out where the problem is, okay? So this gives them a very specific localization as to where that bleeding is occurring from. Okay. Well, you know about CAT scanning. CAT scanning is a body section x-ray, okay? Well, in nuclear medicine, we have body section also, okay? We have two types. You know, one's called SPECT, and you've probably heard of PET scanning. Uh, you've probably heard about that this morning and whatever. Well, the whole idea or concept, uh, Dr. David Kuhl, uh, who uh, was at the University of Pennsylvania when he did this, actually developed a methodology for doing body section imaging in nuclear medicine, okay? And here you see, for instance, on the left, those red lines are going through a particular part. That is a uh, big abscess that the patient has in the brain. And you can see on the right uh, a specific body section imaging that more precisely localizes exactly where it is as compared to looking at the overall image you know, as a whole. <clears throat> now here's a brain scan that's done with PET. And this is a body section. You know, you've you got to picture this, okay? This is going crosswise through the brain, okay, from top to bottom. So basically, uh, this is the very top of the head, right over here, and you're going from front to back. This is the front of the head, this is the back of the head. So notice as we go from front to back, that notice this rim, okay? This rim is very uniform throughout. This is, again, uh, blood flow we're looking at, or, and, and, and the way the brain is utilizing sugar, glucose metabolism, going from the front to the back of the head. So this is a normal study. Now what do you see here? Do you notice that the whole left side is missing here? Okay, see that? Pretty clear? This patient's had a stroke. So the left side of his brain is uh, not getting the blood supply that the right side of the brain is getting, okay? Look at this one. Now, what you should notice here, if you go from front to back, notice that the back portion here thins out. You can see it very well here in color. The yellow is the brain, okay, the brain perfusion, and notice that it's missing all the way back here. If you look at the side view of the brain, notice this is the front of the head, this is the back of the head. Can you see that the, oops, can you see that the posterior portion of, doesn't have as much activity as the area more forward to it, okay? What is this? This is Alzheimer's disease. This is a PET scan of the brain, and here is a patient with a very advanced, so what the red arrows are showing you here is that that posterior part of the brain has really considerably lost its blood flow. This is the typical picture of Alzheimer's disease on a PET scan of the brain. Okay, here's what a PET scanner looks like. Looks like a CAT scanner, okay? And if the patient's inside the PET scanner, uh, the signal from the isotope that we're giving goes as a whole set of detectors around the patient. So simultaneously, it goes 180 degrees, and that's what gives us very, very precise localization from what's going on, okay? Now, this is the very first PET scan ever performed, okay? This Dr. Brownell was up in Boston, and this was published in 1953, but he had very crude instruments. He didn't have what we have now. And this was a, uh, a tumor, and he used an isotope called a positron isotope. That's what PET stands for, arsenic-74, not the arsenic that kills you, a different arsenic. Okay, now fusion images, and this is the point. Now, we've talked a little bit about x-ray. We've talked a little bit about nuclear medicine, a lot about nuclear medicine. Why choose? Why not put them both together? and get optimal information, okay? And that's what we do now. We do a study, these are different instruments, we do a study called PET-CT, okay? And we have both, and what do we achieve by that? Well, here's an example of a patient with a lung tumor. Here it is on the CAT scan. Here it is on the PET scan, okay? And here it is what we call a fusion image. One, the PET scan is superimposed on the X-ray, on the CAT scan, and this is called a fusion image. Okay, and it gives us very, very precise localization, and this is pretty much state of the art now. Okay, so you know what? What does CT add? Well, you know, it, it lets us see it's better resolved. Uh, it's got better resolution. We can see it better. 
uh, lo localize the uptake to, in bone versus soft tissue. Uh, it can help distinguish a benign from a malignant tumor because sometimes if a patient has, let's say, a nodule in the lung and your doctor's not sure if it might be benign or a malignancy, you can do a PET scan because if it picks up this glucose compound uh, very avidly, there's more of a chance that it's malignant. Most benign things would not pick it up. So what do we use? Well, this particular PET scan, the most common thing that's used is sugar, a glucose compound. Here's the structure of glucose, okay? And what you see, the way we make the isotope of the radiopharmaceutical is we take this, it's called a hydroxyl group, this guy over here, see it? And we substitute an isotope. It happens to be something called fluorine 18. So now we have a glucose compound but with an isotope attached to it. So we're able to look at sugar metabolism throughout the body. Here's a patient that has a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you see one of the beauties of the PET scan here. Uh, after two treatments, I mean, all of the black stuff that you're seeing here is actual disease. This is lymph node disease. After two treatments, look at the PET scan. It's all gone. Okay? And that's what we like to see, obviously. And you can see what a tremendous help this is to <clears throat> your doctor treating you. Because... Um, you know, uh, if you just look at an x-ray, a patient may have uh, a mass, let's say, in the chest, and let's say they've gotten a treatment, and they're getting better. But, you know, the mass in the chest anatomically on an x-ray may not go away immediately. Maybe it takes a few months before it shrinks down and goes away. But this is something we're looking at function here, and the sugar metabolism that we're looking at here is gone immediately, so that tells the doctor they're really on the right track as far as the treatment is concerned. Here's a patient that's got an esophagus cancer, and all these black things in the middle are lymph nodes, and here's a lymph node up here also. And after therapy, you can see, this is before surgery, you can see that it's much, much better. This is much smaller. These are the kidneys. And all that stuff in the middle in the lymph nodes are all gone. Okay? This indicates the patient is now a good candidate for surgery and should do well with surgery, the fact that they've responded so well to the initial chemotherapy. <clears throat> Here's a breast cancer. You can see the breast cancer is picking up very, very actively. Unfortunately, this particular patient you see does have lymph nodes in the axillary region and in the chest, in the near the heart, in the mediastinum, and in the lung. Uh, but this will likely respond to chemotherapy, and this is the way that we monitor it. This is called a sentinel node lymph localization study. And if you know any people or if anyone in the audience might have had breast cancer, uh, you know that one of the things that we do beforehand is a nuclear medicine test. We inject some isotope around the tumor, and we look at the site of drainage. And these lines that you see, these are four different patients. So here you see this is called a lymphatic channel. This is going to the armpit, the axilla. There's one lymph node here. In this case, the patient has two lymphatic channels. In this case, the patient's got three, but they're all going to the same place in the axilla. So what happens is the surgeon takes out those lymph nodes, okay, with a little probe. He can locate, almost like a Geiger counter, can locate where the activity is. He removes them and sends them to the pathologist while the patient is still on the operating table. The pathologist examines them. If those lymph nodes are negative and no tumor has spread to those lymph nodes, that's the end of the surgery. The patient doesn't have to have a more extensive axillary dissection. And you probably know patients who have lymphedema, their arms swell, and all sorts of problems like that. So this is what the current state of the art is, and it's a nuclear medicine study called Sentinel Node. You know what a sentinel is? Sentinel's the guy, the poor guy that's looking out for the troops while all the other guys are sleeping. You know, he's watching the front uh, lines. So basically, this is called a sentinel node localization. All right, we're almost finished, doctors. Uh, just quickly, doctors, Rosalind Yallo and Saul Burson developed a technique called radioimmunoassay. This is used to measure tiny amounts of substances in the body and the bloodstream. We, they used it originally for insulin. It's used now for drug overdose, uh, things like that. It's, uh, uh, it's called radioimmunoassay. Dr. Burson died, but Dr. Yallo won the Nobel Prize for this particular discovery. <coughs> These are some of the therapies that we do. I've mentioned thyroid, hypothyroidism, thyroid cancer. Uh, 
we do have a treatment if somebody is suffering from bone metastases, from bone spread. Uh, we do have treatments to help them out and to help with the pain. Uh, we do have treatments, antibody treatments for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. And we have specific treatments now where we treat if there's been any tumor spread to the liver. Uh, we actually have a method of uh, putting radioactive spheres directly through an artery that goes into the liver and get very, very selective therapy, right thing. Obviously, as I mentioned before, these are beta emitters, not gamma emitters. So basically, uh, okay, just quickly, the Society of Nuclear Medicine. Society of Nuclear Medicine, which you're sitting at here, uh, 1954 it originated. This is their Declaration of Independence. You can see the signatures. And interestingly, uh, you can see that this started in Spokane, Washington, very locally. Uh, in 1954, uh, the 12 people who signed that document, interesting, nine physicians and three physicists, chemists. Dr. Fahey, who just spoke to you beforehand, was of course a physicist, because on the basis of that original uh, setup for the society, they decided that every fourth year, the president of the society should be a non-physician. And Dr. Fahey, who just is finishing his year as physician as, uh, uh, right now. So, you know, here the first, second, third, and fourth president. You recognize the name Norman Holter? You hear the Holter monitor? Okay, the same guy. Okay, he was from Montana, and uh, he developed the Holter monitor. He was also the fourth president of the Society of Nuclear Medicine. And he was a basic scientist. Uh, these are the executive directors. Dr. V uh, Virginia Pappas is our current director right now. There are a bunch of chapters, as you see, regionally broken up throughout the country that have their own meetings and function also. This, of course, is the big national meeting you're at. The American Board of Nuclear Medicine, nuclear medicine physicians are examined and board certified. Uh, this was set up in 1972. Uh, and, of course, we have our philanthropic arm, which is the Education and Research Foundation, which gives grants of various sorts to uh, young investigators, people like that. And, uh, the two gentlemen I mentioned, the two instrument pioneers, well, they made so much dough from their inventions that they were very generous and in their wills, in their estates. You see, they donated, uh, Drs. Kasson and Anger, donated considerable amounts to the Education and Research Foundation of a lot of grants and awards that are put out, and essentially, that's it. So um, I've taken you for a little trip uh, through the history of what's going on with our specialty, and um, Hopefully you've enjoyed it. You've learned a little bit more about you know, how we operate, what nuclear medicine is all about, and uh, it really should not be a mystery to you. <laughs>